Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. I come to you from a universe far, far away, uh, the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. My friend Dale comes from an even further universe, so I'll let him tell you about where that's from. And we're going to, our panel today of speakers is going to give you a potpourri of different perspectives about employment. Uh, you're in the midst of some significant change, and uh, I hope that what we offer you today will be helpful as you're looking forward to it. So I thought a lot about what, what could fill 20 minutes of time in a way that, uh, that, that you could use, uh, leave with something useful. And uh, one of the uh, dearest concepts to my heart in this field uh, is, the, is the idea of discovery. And discovery fits well, I think, with the theme of the conference. Discovery is going to allow us, whether it's for the people that we're working with or possibly even for ourselves, uh, to build on strengths and to reset our GPS clearly toward employment outcomes for people. And a way to think about discovery, first, it's a, it's a qualitative approach to understanding people. We don't have to test them. We don't have to compare them. They don't have to pass. They will not fail discovery. And in doing that, I, I turned to a gentleman I wish I had met. I'm afraid he had passed before uh, I came along, though. But his Nobel Peace Prize winner for identifying uh, that vitamin C was an aspect of cit citric acid. His name is Georgi, Hungarian gentleman. He really had a way with the English language. And he once suggested that uh, when asked about how he did what he did, how did he make these discoveries, he, uh, he mused about discovery. And he figured that discovery consists of looking at the same thing as everyone else and seeing something different. I think that's a profound statement, particularly in relation to the people that we work with on a daily basis. That many of you know the people who you work with and have known them for years. But we have to believe that what you see is not all that you might get. It's not all of who they are. And if we think about this, if we, if we think about intentionally seeing people in a unique way, then possibility begins to emerge. And we could do a two or a three day training on discovery, but if I were to try to help you with the essence, just distilled at its, at its barest bones, you're really looking for three things in discovery to give us direction for employment, to set that GPS. We're looking for things in people's lives that are indicative of success for them. We call those conditions for success. And if we look in people's lives and see them at their best and when their performance is most successful, we need to say, you know, if we could duplicate that in a workplace, then they would have a very good chance of being successful. We also need to think about interest, and, and that's part of resetting this GPS. Too often we just ask people surface questions. What do you want to do? And too often people give us surface answers. Oh. I would like to be a detective. I would like to be uh, an actor. I would like to be an entertainer, you know, uh, or a bank president or something like that. Well, good. I mean, people ought to aspire. You know, you stick a microphone in front of a four-year-old's face, and they'll say they want to be president or prime minister or something like that. You wonder why anyone would actually want to do that, but they will say that. Um, but I think, I think we need to get deeper. We need to get an intrinsic interest. Every one of us in this room has things that if it's our time, when this conference is over and it's next weekend and, and you get to make a decision, most of us are going to say, well, I'd like to, and then however you fill in the blank is likely to be an intrinsic interest. And in discovery, we really seek to find people's intrinsic interest, not just their answer to the question what job they want, but who they are as people, and then use that as a GPS toward the job market. And then finally, what kind of strengths, what kinds of contributions will people be bringing to potential employers? Oftentimes, the people we represent don't have the whole package. They don't have the whole competitive uh, resume that we can go to an employer with and say, gosh, this person is just as good as any of your other applicants. 
Unfortunately, that's an impact, an aspect of the impact of disability in life. But the folks that we work with all have specific contributions and discovery will allow us to find those and take those forward. And one of the things to think about is people's lives are rich resources of this information, but in the form that they're living their lives, it's often confusing. I told the story last night at a presentation around a young woman whose uh, nine-year-old brother suggested she was at her very best when she was opening Christmas presents, that she could actually open Christmas presents faster than anyone in her family. Well, that, that, that's an amusing aside, but people rarely get credit for how powerful that nine-year-old brother's perspective was. If we're willing to translate that to business terms, Jenny's already got a task to offer that no one had found about her in all of her tests, all of her comparisons, all of her evaluations and her academic scores in, in school and such as that. If we can look at people's lives and translate what they do to possibilities for work, you can't fail that, but you get strong direction. And we can do that for the conditions of employment, those things that I talked about. We look at what works in life and we can translate that to success, successful factors at work, whether it's the working environment or the working relationship, the hours, the days, all of that sort of stuff. We can also look at people's life interests. How many of us actually were asked at the point at which we were uh, moving toward employment, you know, who are you and what would really make it worth getting out of bed in the morning for you to go to work? We weren't asked that. We were just told, well, you got to go to work. I'm sorry you get your enjoyment on the weekend, but, but your work's just really going to be rut-like, you know. You're, you're not likely to enjoy that. And uh, indeed, too many of us are at work in jobs that are, that are not intrinsically motivating at all. Uh, I would hope for you that you would go find such a job in your life. Not that we want you out of this field, but just a good part of life is to do a job that is intrinsically motivating for you. And then finally, as I was saying, we can translate those skills of life into the contributions that people can bring to employers and then even people who experience the most significant impact of disability can be seen as competent because we know people do competent things in life if we look deeply enough. And all of this is about discovery. So let me tell you a couple of stories before I hand over to Dale. Um, this is a, a wonderful story about a man who was working in a sheltered workshop and he really uh, the, the staff wanted him to leave, and, and uh, Larry was kind of a grumpy old guy, uh, and uh, we, we do get grumpier as we get older maybe, and, and he would just say no, you know, and the staff would go, come on Larry, you're really good. And he finally agreed, he, he didn't pass tests very well, and he seemed to like the sheltered workshop, so it's like, why should we move forward with Larry, you know? But Larry's life could be significantly enhanced, I think, by having a job in the community. And during discovery, we learned a lot about Larry, a lot of his skills, but he still seemed to have a secret. Certainly no one at the workshop knew about it. And even the person doing discovery, one of the best facilitators of discovery I ever knew, she couldn't figure it out. And, and she did have good information about Larry's conditions for success, and she had great information about his potential contributions, but she was still lost about interest, that, that direction beacon toward the community. And finally, after several weeks of discovery, she talked to Larry and his, and his mother. He was living with his mother and, and said, Larry, I know there's a secret. There's got to be something. Please tell me. What's, what's going on? And his mother looked at Larry and said, Larry, I think you ought to tell her. I think she's earned your trust. And Larry kind of had his head down and said, Larry, would you like me to tell her? And um, he nodded his head, yes. Mom was being quite respectful of Larry's uh, feelings. And he said, you know, what Larry doesn't want to tell you is that every day he comes home from the sheltered workshop, he sits out on the front stoop, his steps, and the postal delivery person, in this case the mailman, comes in. And Larry has a relationship with the mailman no one knows about. And in fact, every day, 
when the mail is delivered, Larry sits out there and these guys talk. The mail delivery carrier puts his sack down and these guys sit and talk about things. He said, you know, first he, he taught Larry how the numbering system worked on the street and he would let Larry sort the mail and then taught him how the numbers related one to the other. And then he started, then he started teaching him the names of the different people. Now folks, if it's occurring to you, this is all highly illegal. Okay, this is not appropriate for the mail carrier, A, to stop work in the delivery route, but B, to start showing Larry, sorry about that. But he said, you know, Larry wants to, Larry wants to handle the mail more than anything. And he's scared to death that if he tells someone, we'll tell him no. He'd rather hang on to the dream than have his dream dashed. And Melinda said, Larry, if you're saying that, that you would work if I can get you a job handling the mail, then I'll, I'll do that for you. That's the only places I will call. And he looked at her like, don't lie to me, lady. And Melinda carried through. Now, the US Post Office is not the most accepting place in the world. Uh, but she ended up at a mailboxes, et cetera, where he's talking to a guy named Frank and was telling Larry's story. And looks up and Frank, this six, six, six foot six guy, is crying. And Lynn said, I'm sorry, sir, if I said something that's, that's bothered you. And he said, well, yeah, but it's, it's not your fault. He said, that's my story. And Melinda blurted out, you mean a mailman taught you how to read and, and, and uh, identify numbers? He said, no, the SOBs at the post office wouldn't hire me. Um, so I started a competition with them called mailboxes, et cetera. And Melinda said, well, how would you like to meet Larry? So imagine the way that just the stories of discovery, Larry's still working there. He's a really old fart. And people have dreams, you know, Trang wants to be a, a, a disc jockey in a radio station. And I don't know really how to help a person with intellectual and developmental disabilities just step into a competitive thing like that. But we can, we can make sure in using the concepts of, of customized employment and supported employment that we can actually find ways to get people uh, having an aspect of their dream. And this isn't patronizing. This isn't saying, no, you can't be a disc jockey, so you just have to do tasks in a radio station. This is saying probably most just disc jockeys start in a position just like that. I don't know if you would ever be one, but if you're going to be, you need to, you need to start paying your dues. And so Trang is working in a radio station. In Discovery, we found Matt laying on a couch and his mother in the most gentle and respectful way she can says, I'm sorry, my son is a couch potato. He has been laying on that couch ever since he got out of school. I think he's sat very depressed. Um, he, he can't find a job. Nobody wants to work with him. He's failed evaluations. And if you want a direction, you need to find what would get Matt off the couch. And it turns out he loves every kind of motorized piece of equipment. Now this is a guy in Utah, so he shares a little bit of environmental stuff with you guys. You know what a snow machine is. You probably know what a four-wheeler or an ATV is. Anything like that Matt loves. And his family actually has a snow machine and an ATV. But nobody ever thought that that could turn into employment. We said, Matt, is this what lights your fire? Is this what gets you off the couch? And, and it's like, absolutely yes. Matt's been working for a year and a half. At the, at the largest motorsport, uh, uh, recreational motorsport company in North Salt Lake. Um, and the tasks that he does, he also, we found uh, during discovery that he had tasks on the computer that aren't necessarily competitive in his speed, but that were quality. And so by offering all of this, Matt's deep interest, and the fact that he had these tasks to an employer that had needs and benefit from Matt, what Matt offered, he's been working. We discovered Robert was very conflicted about work. All the men in his family were, were woodworkers, and yet people had been trying to get him to do dishwashing and janitorial tasks, and he would quit anything that the staff tried to get him to do. But by honoring his interests, by following you know, the tradition of his family, we were able to find a, a master cabinet worker who had just gotten his uh, uh, union card of, of being a master cabinet worker in Pittsburgh. And what he was doing was spending most of his time going back and forth to his tool cabinet. He was in a public area where he had to lock up his tools. 
And we identified, wouldn't it be nice to have someone kind of the, the, the equivalent of a surgery nurse handing a doctor a scalpel to handle, uh, hand a master carpenter the various tools and lock them up? Well, that lasted for about a month before the carpenter realized that Robert actually had some carpentry skills and now both these guys could use uh, a preparation or a, a, an assistant to hand them tools. When I met Ethan during Discovery, I, I was a young man with, with Down syndrome, he's in his last year of high school, voc rehab said he couldn't work in his community. And I simply went into his bedroom. He asked me to go in. I looked at his mom. She said, sure, go in. And I loved the guy immediately. I'm from the Gulf Coast, so I'm a Saints fan. Sorry, Dale. And um, that's football, in case you don't know. And, um, and there was a Saints poster right above his bed. And then around the, that's professional football. All around that was University of Utah in red. They're called the Utes. And he loves University of Utah. And uh, again, during his school transition, they'd, he had been doing all kinds of things like washing dishes and, and just, uh, you know, it's, it, there's nothing wrong with these tasks if that's what people want to do. But it wasn't motivating Ethan at all. Ethan now works at the, at the, the academic, the, excuse me, the athletic department at the University of Utah. The, I mean, the place that he would just dream to work. He works with the most beautiful young women you can imagine. And in, he doesn't take a bus to work. He does not, uh, his mother doesn't take him to work. He doesn't walk to work or ride his bike. He floats to work. And I'll end with Anna. Uh, Anna was a woman that can kind of say to you, are you really too old to work? State of Illinois was confronted by our federal government for having people with developmental disabilities in nursing homes. And Anna had went into a nursing home when she was in her 20s. And now she's 78 and she's going to get out because we finally confronted those nursing homes. And we're thinking, oh, she would, she would want to retire. And it's like, retire from what? I've been sitting in a nursing home for the last 50 years. I want to work, you know? And in discovery, we found something simple. She walked around that nursing home with a camera around her neck, an old Kodak camera that took film pictures. And we saw her, her, uh, her, uh, photo albums of all the pictures she took. And one of the things that happened to be noticed is that every picture was perfectly oriented. She could frame a picture so no one's head was cut off or, you know, half your body was on the side of the picture. And then we began to look at the business community and found that at that time, law firms particularly were digitizing all of their paper stuff and they were contracting this out and they were getting crap for these contracts. In other words, they were getting these, these important documents that were half off the paper or sideways or twisted. And so Anna goes to work uh, doing scanning because she can, you see how you're translating? If you can center every picture, you can center the, the things here. Anna was 78. She worked until she was 82. She went home one day and died, a working woman. So what I'd like to leave you with, if you're kind of looking for a direction, which way to go, let's take discovery, and I think you'll find some direction for that GPS. Thank you very much.